Good evening, Southridge Church. Uh, my name is J.D. Turley, and I'm coming to you this evening uh, here in the prayer room of the church uh, to bring to you uh, week two of our series, Problem Child, where we're stepping through the book of uh, 1 Corinthians. Um, if you missed last week, I encourage you to go back. Uh, Pastor Scott did a really great job of uh, opening up the series, and he set forth some of the uh, background information that would come in handy uh, if you were going to watch the remainder of the weeks. So, <clears throat> um, problem child, week one would be Scott. Um, he was in chapter one of 1 Corinthians, and I'm going to take us through uh, chapter two. Um, as we get into the scripture, once again, it's 1 Corinthians chapter two. Um, what I saw in chapter two uh, when Paul is writing to the Corinthian church. And, and here's what we have to uh, remember about this letter, is that Paul was writing this letter to a church that was a, in a pretty good uh, state of crisis. They, they were uh, having several issues. So Paul wanted to set those straight. Um, and it, it's, it's a sort of a return to basics here in chapter 2 at the beginning of the letter. Uh, Paul sets forth a, a very simple return to basics, which I'm going to walk us through. Um, and, and, and it's almost as if, uh, as Paul said in chapter 1, when the church was very young, they didn't have a lot of mature believers yet, um, he had to bring them back to the basics, the basics of the faith. And that's where we stand here today. We're going to be returning to the good news, returning to the gospel message, um, that we're never too mature to return back to. Um, so the lesson that uh, God has given me here for today, this evening, is it's the gospel message, especially for sinners to hear. If, if you're not uh, normally in church, if you don't consider yourself a Christian, this message is specifically for you um, because it is the gospel message. You're going to hear what the gospel message is. Um, but if you are already a Christian, it's also important to hear because I believe it's so important, especially in today's time and age, that Christians are able to articulate the gospel. Not just preachers and teachers and, and people who are in leadership roles, but every single Christian. You should be able to share with someone that you know what is the gospel, why is it so important, why has it had such an effect on your life. So... We're going to start in the scripture. We're going to walk through the scripture here in 1 Corinthians chapter 2. Um, and we're only we're going to spend most of our time, maybe all of our time here, um, in the first five verses of chapter, chapter 2. So, once again, this is Paul writing to um, the church here in Corinth. Starting with chapter 2, he says in verse 1, And so it was with me, brothers and sisters, when I came to you, I did not come with eloquence or human wisdom as I proclaimed to you the testimony about God. So in this first verse, he said, as, and so it was with me. What he's speaking of is near the end of chapter one, he was talking about how he's not going to be boasting in anything except for Christ. And so that is how it is with him as well. And when he came to the Corinthian church and preached to him, he says, when I came to you, I did not come with eloquence or human wisdom. And in that, I find almost a form of comfort, especially as a, as a teacher here at Southridge Church on the, on the teaching team, that I don't have to perform. I don't have to be the wisest person on the earth. I don't have to say really big words to impress people because the power isn't in me. The power is in the message that I'm speaking about. The power is in the gospel. Um, so I, I, I kind of take a comfort in that first verse. Continuing on with verse 2. For I resolved to know nothing while I was with you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. I came to you in weakness with great fear and trembling. So in verse, returning to verse 2 for just a second. Jesus Christ and Him crucified. That's where we're going to spend most of our time here today. But um, not to not to be confused, Paul did teach the whole doctrine of God, um, but his main focus was on Jesus. 
And the reason being, until a person understands and believes the gospel, there's not really much else to teach them as far as the scripture is concerned. Yeah, there's a whole lot after that fact, but until a person comes to a belief in the gospel and an understanding of the true gospel message, there's not much else to say to them. And so Paul speaks that in verse 2. He says, I, I, I resolve not to know anything except for Christ and him crucified. Verse 3 said, I came to you in weakness with great fear and trembling. Uh, there's two different aspects to this verse, and I, I believe they're both true. Um, the first part, I came to you in weakness. Paul was probably weakened by his ministry. He had been stoned. He had been uh, beaten. He had been shouted down. He had been ran out of different towns. So just through his ministry, he was probably physically weak. But through his physical weakness, uh, Christ's power was even more revealed. Um, and when he says, with great fear and trembling, um, I believe Paul understood the seriousness of his message. Uh, in James chapter 3, verse 1, it speaks about how teachers will be uh, judged more severely because we're responsible for sharing the gospel. And it is our responsibility to make sure the gospel is taught in its whole truth. Um, so Paul, I believe, understands that, and that's why he's saying he's coming to them, uh, one, physically weak, and two, with fear and trembling, he, he understands the seriousness of the situation. Uh, continuing on into verse 4 and 5, My message and my preaching were not with wise and persuasive words, but with a demonstration of the Spirit's power, so that your faith might not rest on human wisdom, but on God's power. Paul understood that there was no part of himself uh, in this gospel message. It is wholly the power of God to save. He is just the messenger, just like I am just the messenger. There's nothing special about me. There's nothing special about any preacher any leader that's sharing the gospel is the power of the message itself. So we're looking here at a return to basics. Paul is returning the Corinthian church to the basics of the faith here at the beginning of the, of the, of the book, of the letter. Um, and this is during a trying time, like I said, for the church. The church in Corinth was in a state of crisis. There was a lot of stuff going on that shouldn't be going on. And Paul was trying to correct them and to lead them uh, into righteousness. Um, and I, as I study theology, as I study the Word, and I study all the different ins and outs and all the different beliefs that people have, once again, I take comfort in coming back to the basics. I take comfort in the simplicity of the gospel. It is a simple message that even a child can understand it. But at the same time, it's, it, it can be complex. Um, but I, I take comfort uh, returning to the basics, returning to the gospel message. So, as I said, we're going to spend most of our time in verse 2. Um, verse 2 is where Paul states, he said, I resolved to know nothing while I was with you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. So, Paul was presenting to them or reminding them of this gospel message that he preached to them. And he, his main focus was on Jesus and his crucifixion. See, Jesus was truly God and, and truly man, and he stepped down out of uh, his rightful place in heaven to come to this earth, to come into his creation, so that he may save us, to live a sinless life, to be crucified, to become that atoning sacrifice that was necessary for us. He was buried in the tomb, and three days later he was resurrected. You've probably heard this story, especially if you've been in church uh, at, any, at all in your life. You've heard the story, you're familiar with these details. These are the foundational truths of the Christian faith. Um, as I read this verse, I, I ask myself, I was like, why did, why did Paul use... Why did Paul use the word crucified? Why, why that word? 
I resolve to know it nothing but Jesus Christ and Him crucified. Why, why didn't he say something like, I resolve to know nothing but Jesus Christ and Him loving us, or Jesus Christ and Him doing good works, or Jesus Christ and Him healing people, or performing miracles? Why did he choose Jesus Christ and Him crucified? I believe it is showing us the seriousness of the situation and a lot of times especially uh, today when someone is trying to present the gospel they they come to the point where they say Jesus loves you and that's where their gospel message stops that that's where it ends and that's a very dangerous place to end it's not that it's not true Jesus absolutely loves you and we're going to show you exactly how much he loves you here in just a minute. But when your gospel message stops there, it can, it can be dangerous. It can lead to false doctrine. It can lead to uh, false, even false gospels. We see this when we talk about uh, the prosperity gospel, where it says, well, Jesus wants nothing for you except for you to, to do well here on this earth and to live a successful life and to be a successful business person and to have that car or that house, when in reality that's not, that's not what the gospel is at all. Jesus was saying, uh, Jesus absolutely does love you, and he wants the best for you, but where we sometimes get that twisted when we stop there is that we think the best for us is what we think is the best for us. We think that brand new job or that brand new car or that brand new house is the best for us. Jesus wants the best for us, but he realizes, he sees things through the eternal perspective, and the best for us is for us to spend eternity with him. And whatever happens to get us to that point, that's, that's going to be allowed. That's, that's going to be his mission, to get us to that point. That's what's best for us. So it's not necessarily our prosperity. We, we very well could prosper, but that's not guaranteed to us. We could live a life of pain, but as long as it gets us to eternity with Christ, that's the mission. That's the gospel. We said, yes, absolutely Jesus loves you, but we can't stop there because Jesus loved us so much. He loved us so much that he was willing to come into his creation. Because he realized there was no other way for us to be uh, our sins to be atoned for, for us to be forgiven of our sins. It, it was not within our capacity to save ourselves. He had to come into his creation to create a way for us to be uh, to be saved. He displayed his love for us by this. This is how much he loved. He was willing to humble himself. Come to earth truly man, truly God. Live that perfect life and die for us. His blood was re the requirement for our sins. So that's how much Jesus loves you. He was willing to die for you. Dying for us while we were still sinners. And that's the, that's the even more significant part. He didn't come to die for you when you were at your best. When you were working at the soup kitchen. Or when you were... Uh, volunteering at the orphanage or when you were preaching on the street corner. He came to this earth. He chose to come to this earth to die for you when you were at your most despicable, when you were at your worst, when you were wallowing in the worst sin you can imagine, when you were at your absolute worst. Jesus loved you so much. He wanted to save you so much. He came to this earth. He stepped down from his throne in heaven and came to this earth to do the, to work out the gospel. That is significant. So if Christ had to face death to save us, it must be a very serious issue. This isn't something that we can just kind of toss off as not really necessary. This is the foundation of our faith, this gospel message. Because if it required the blood of our God to save us, it's a very serious issue. One that we should take very serious. This is why Paul said he came with fear and trembling 
whenever he preached the gospel because he understood the seriousness of the situation. It's literally a life or death situation. A lot of times people say that. A lot of times you hear that and it's like it's not very serious. It's not an actual issue. They're just kind of trying to blow something up into a serious issue. But this is literally a life or death issue. Paul realized that, the seriousness of the situation. Christ had to die for us so that we could be saved. This is the gospel message. See, a lot of times we start the gospel message somewhere else. We start with, yes, Jesus loves you, or, or okay, you, you, might not be, you, you might not be as good as you should be. We try to sugarcoat it. Here's where the gospel has to start. God, the creator of the world, is a holy God. And a lot of times I don't think we understand what the word holy means. It's perfectly pure. No sin. God's completely incapable of sin. He's completely pure and holy. And he is a just God. So here's what that means. One, God can't sin. He can't even be around sin. Two, where he's just, he is required, because he is a just God, to punish sin. A lot of times at this point, this is where you hear, well, I'm a good person. I'm a good person, so God can't send me to hell. Uh, I, I should be able to make it to heaven. Well, here's the problem with that. The Bible tells us that every man, every woman, every person that has ever lived uh, has sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. That's Romans chapter 3. And when we hear, oh, well, I'm a good person. Well, no, you're not, because the Bible also tells us that there's none righteous, not even one person that's righteous on this earth, Jesus being the only fulfillment of that requirement. So there lies our problem. God is holy and he is just. We are sinners. So that's, that's the huge problem that we have. That, that, that is the problem that we cannot cure. That is the problem that we cannot uh, rectify ourselves. We can't do any amount of good works. We can't uh, go back and fix all our past mistakes. It's not going to be good enough because God is perfectly holy and perfectly just. So therein lies our problem. What we deserve as human beings, as as people on this sin-cursed earth, we are deserving of death and hell. And I, I know that's blunt, and I know that's not preached a lot, but that's what the scriptures tell us. We have all sinned. We have all fallen short of the glory of God. So therefore, even if there's just one sin, God is perfectly holy. He cannot tolerate sin. So if we, and we all have, if we have even just one sin in our life, we are deserving of death and hell. So here's the issue. Here's the good news. The true gospel message is that even though we are deserving of hell, there's a way out for us. Christ has provided that way out for us. See, we must come to the end of ourselves. We, we, can't, we can't put our trust in ourselves. We can't put our trust in our good works. I've even heard people say, well, my mom and dad were really big in church and they were kind of riding on the coattails of their parents. That's not going to work for you. Um, no good deeds are going to be able to be enough. See, what's, been, what's necessary for you to be saved has already been done for you. That's the good news of the gospel. We must come to the end of ourselves. Christ calls us to die daily. There's, there's a reason why he said, you must pick up your cross daily and follow me. The cross was a sign of execution. It was literally hanging people and killing them. It's not until a person realizes who they truly are and who Christ truly is will they understand and accept the gospel. You have to understand what your stance is before God. How God sees you. He loves you very much, but he cannot tolerate sin. You must understand who Jesus is. Jesus is God come to this earth to die for you. This is why the gospel is such good news. See, a, a drowning man won't reach his hand out to be saved if he doesn't realize he's being, he's, he's drowning. That's why it's so important to start out the gospel presentation with God being holy and just. To, 
to get people to realize, hey, I, I need to be, I, I need saved. I need to be rectified to God. I need to be, I need my sins atoned for. I need all this to work out and I can't do it. I can't do it myself. I need somebody to save me. That's why we call Jesus our Savior because he came to this earth to save us. And it's not until we come to that point, it's not until we come to the end of ourselves where we realize I, I have nothing to offer God. There's nothing that I can do to uh, win my salvation. I have nothing. And when you come to that end point of yourself and you decide to fully put all your trust, all your hope, all your faith in Christ, that is the gospel message. He promises that he will forgive us our sins and he will bring us into eternity with him. This is why the gospel is, is such good news. Through Christ's crucifixion and resurrection, he atones our sin. He imputes his righteousness onto us. One of the best ways I've ever heard the gospel explained, and it's a very simple sentence. It says, we can stand in front of God as if we were Christ. Because Christ stood in front of God as if he were us. He took what we deserved from God. He was crucified for us. He paid our sin debt with his death. So what is our response? It's a very simple response. And that's why Paul is bringing the Corinthian church here in chapter 2 back to the basics. Our response See, our salvation is through grace alone, by faith alone, in Christ alone. Don't add anything else to the equation. It's only by the grace of God that he begins to speak to your heart. He starts to pull you towards him. It's by your faith in Christ alone. Not in good works, not in anything that you can do, but in Christ's action and his work on the cross that you are saved. So our response is simply that. Put your faith in Christ. Come to Christ in faith. Declare your, your faith in Him. Declare Him as God. Ask Him to forgive you for your sins and allow Him to, to work in you and repent from your sins. To turn away from the old way you started to live or you had been living and to turn to God. That is our response. And I, I thank God that, as Paul said, there's nothing that I could do I could sit here in front of this camera for days and days on end and, and preach until I was blue in the face and beg and plead with you. And I, I, I thank God that it's not in me because I, I'm, I'm a nobody. <laughs> and, and that sounds like self, self-deprecating, self but it's the truth. Like, it's not in me. It's in the message. It's in the power of God. It's in the message of the gospel. And I, I thank God for that because... Um, it, it releases me, so to speak. All i got to do is be the messenger, and, then, and God's Spirit will do its work. So let me pray for us, um, and that's all I have. Um, tune in next week for week three of uh, Problem Child. Um, and if you feel like this message has stirred something up in your heart, uh, maybe it has exposed something, maybe... God has spoke to you in a certain way, don't ignore that. Okay, I would, I would encourage you to seek that out. Um, if you have questions, reach out to somebody. Reach out to me, reach out to somebody here at the church. Um, very easy to get a hold of us. Um, if it's not us, reach out to another Christian somewhere that you may know. But don't let that stirring in your heart die out and, and just push it away. There, it's there for a reason. Um, so let me pray for us and we'll be finished Heavenly Father we're so thankful that your gospel message is the simple truth and it is the only way in which we can come to salvation and spend eternity with you we know from your word Lord that it is not your desire for any of us to die and be sent to hell that it is your desire for all of us to come to salvation and we just pray and ask God for whoever is listening to this message, Lord, uh, wherever they may be, God, that it stirs something in their heart. If they're already a Christian, that it would encourage them to share this gospel message with others. And if they don't know you as their Lord and Savior yet, Lord, that uh, maybe this would uh, speak to them to where they would 
start thinking about their salvation and come to you in faith and repentance. Lord, it's through your power, and I'm, I'm so very thankful that it's not anything that I can say or anything that is required of me other than obedience to your message. We thank you, Lord, for your love and your grace, and we thank you, Lord, that salvation is through grace alone, by faith alone, in Christ alone. We love you and we thank you, for it's in your holy name we pray. Amen.